Hi, I'm Doris Epstein and this is Mensch Life TV. Today we're going to be talking to two young Canadian lawyers that in different parts of the world are making enormous impact. First of all, Brooke Goldstein. Welcome, Brooke. You're doing the Lawfare Project and the Children's Rights Institute. Lawfare is a is a, is a use of, of, of the law as a weapon of war. Is that correct? correct? Exactly. So the Lawfare Project mm -hmm. and Adam Hummel, welcome Adam. Thank you. That started a peace project in all places, Kenya, that's taking off and becoming a peace movement. Yes. We'll find out more about it later. And first, Brooke, the Lawfare Project. But mm -hmm. you want to begin with a movie that started you in this direction. Right. You began as an entertainment lawyer? Well, I was studying to become an entertainment lawyer. That's what I thought I wanted to do. But in my second year of law school, I ended up just, you know, by chance taking a class called Human Rights and the Child. And while I was learning in this class, I came home one day and I turned on the TV and I saw an image broadcast before me that was very troublesome. And it was a 15-year-old, physically handicapped Palestinian boy with live explosives strapped around his waist. And the more I studied it, the more I realized that the recruitment of innocent children to become suicide bombers is a human rights violation. It's a form of child abuse, and yet nobody was raising awareness about it. So I raised some funds, and I made a documentary film about okay, it. Okay, let's see it. Here it comes. Hawara Checkpoint, where is that? That's just outside Nablus. Is that him? Yes, so this is Hussam Abdu. This is right after he's been caught. He's being instructed now to cut off the bomb bell. That started your odyssey. Right. So it was basically through the film that I became an advocate for the human rights of innocent Muslim children who are being recruited towards violence. And I wanted to fill in the gap with my organization, the Children's Rights Institute, um, in areas and expose areas that are too politically incorrect for groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International to focus on. You've written a book. Let's jump to the Lawfare okay. Project. Lawfare, I've never heard that term before, mm. is like warfare, only it's the use of the law, and you claim that it's infiltrating our society, and it's on the increase. Absolutely, it has infiltrated our society. Over the past 12 years, we have seen a very steady increase of sympathizers of terrorist groups and those who want to undermine liberal democracy maneuver within our own legal systems to undermine the very principles they stand for. 
freedom of speech, self-defense, the right to exert sovereign control over your territory. Those are all rights that are being undermined, not just at the United Nations, but also in local courts throughout Europe, here in Canada, also in the United States, in Canada as well. You had a movement. I mean, the Canadians did a wonderful thing when they repealed Article 13 of the, I think it was the Canadian Human Rights Act, which made it uh, a crime to say anything offensive to anyone based on their religion. And what happened? People like Ezra Levant, who's on Sun TV, the media personality, when he republished the Danish cartoon of Muhammad in the now defunct Western Standard magazine, he was hauled before the Canadian Human Rights Commission to defend this parody and, and exercise a free speech about a very important issue. He's not the only one. No, he's not. Mark Stein, Here's same the title thing happened to him. Of, of, of Brooks' book, Lawfare, the War Against Free Speech, a First Amendment guide for reporting in an age of Islamist warfare. Islamist lawfare. Lawfare. Mm -hmm. For that last phrase alone, mm -hmm. I'm surprised that you're not up against a, a human rights tribunal or being sued. Well, look, um, if someone, God forbid, tried ever to take me to court for what's in that book, they would fail because what's in the book is truth. All the facts that are alleged are true. And frankly, if you can't openly express truths in 2012 in a Western democracy, then we're in a lot of trouble. We'll get back to this in just a minute about how public paralysis has been happening because of the muzzling on so-called free speech and how you're getting away, not only away with this, but have established an organization to support your beliefs and to point out what's going on in our society mm -hmm. in just a minute. Lawfare, the war against free speech with Brooke Goldstein, head of the Lawfare Project. Lawfare, legal laws used as a weapon of war. Correct, exactly. So we've basically identified three goals of the proponents on, of lawfare. The first goal is to silence and punish free speech about militant Islam and, and terrorism in general and its sources of financing. The second goal is to frustrate and undermine the ability of democracies like the United States, like Canada, like Israel to fight and defeat terrorism. And the third is to undermine the rights that a democracy has in international law, the right to self-defense, the right to exert control over their sovereign territory. And there's plenty of examples, unfortunately, of, of all three. Give us some. Okay, well, free speech, for example. Free speech is under attack by those who wish to silence our public dialogue about imminent national security threats like militant Islam. Throughout Europe, we are seeing the steady increase of the filing of hate speech lawsuits, libel lawsuits against anyone who's brave enough even to publish a cartoon of Muhammad like what Ezra did. The, the Danish newspaper Politiken, when it originally published that now infamous cartoon of Muhammad with the bomb in his turban, they did it to show solidarity not just with the cartoonist, but to express free speech. Well, it turns out that they were sued by 94,000 alleged descendants of Islam's prophet Muhammad, who hired a Saudi law firm, and they ended up convincing Politiken or forcing Politiken to issue a public apology for reprinting the Danish cartoon of Muhammad. In the United States, despite the fact that we have the First Amendment, we're also seeing people in the media, counterterrorism experts, bloggers, authors, targeted with frivolous lawsuits. We had a former Congressman Cass Ballinger. He was asked to testify to the FBI about a group called the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE. He called CARE a, quote, fundraising arm for Hezbollah. Is that true? CARE, CARE by the way, is an unindicted co-conspirator in a Hamas funding trial. Okay, Care ended up suing Cass Ballinger for exercising his duty as a public official and trying to protect us, and obviously the judge threw the case out of the court because it had absolutely no merit. But in the end, whether or not the lawfare proponents win the case, 
you're still losing in time and money spent defending your rights and it's created a chilling effect on public dialogue because nobody wants to put themselves out there I was at and a subject themselves an to a lawsuit. I was at an international conference. Two high-ranking RCMP and CSIS officials talked mm -hmm. about the terror, the threat of terror in mm -hmm. Canada, mm -hmm. including the gang that two summers ago plotted with explosives to, to, to bomb. Not one mentioned Muslim that they were Muslim. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. one, is this an example of what we're talking about? Uh, that is an example of self-censorship, and we see that all over. There were uh, Muslim child rape gangs in the UK, and when the newspapers were reporting on it, not one newspaper mentioned that the, these were Muslim men. The gangs, there were Muslim gangs raping, raping non-Muslim children. Kidnapping Muslim children, raping Muslim children. And for some reason, the fact that they were Muslim, the newspapers decided not to publish. Also, in the United States at the same time, we've convicted some Somali men who were also engaged in, in, in a child rape uh, gang. And at the same time, someone like Lars Hardegard, who's a Danish activist, was sued for speaking out against the mass rape of innocent Muslim children. Can you believe that? It's hard to believe. What about in, in, in North America? How, how does it manifest itself, lawfare? And we're talking about mm -hmm. Islam here. Mm -hmm. We're all talking, we're, we're, it, it's all about Islam. Well, we're talking about Islamism. We're talking about the political manifestation of a religion. Islam how do you get away with talking so openly about it? Have you had any threats of suing or legal coercion? Absolutely not. We haven't. And we're very careful. Everything that we say is fact-checked. It's the truth. Um, we operate to protect people who are exercising their rights, their inalienable human rights to speak freely about issues of public concern. And we have an army of attorneys that are ready to stand guard to defend against any type of frivolous lawfare lawsuits. Frivolous? Absolutely. It doesn't sound frivolous to me. It no, sounds it is very serious. Well, the lawsuits themselves in, have no in merit. In terms of not serious, not, not, not mm -hmm. accountable. The effects of these lawsuits are very, very serious. Absolutely. Um, in my opinion, they pose a very serious national security threat. But the lawsuits themselves have absolutely no merit. I mean, we've, there was a lawsuit, for example, the Islamic Society of Boston was building a mosque in Boston. And Fox News and famed counterterrorism expert Stephen Emerson, I believe also the Boston Herald, were publishing articles about the fact that Saudi funds were going towards this mosque. Well, the mosque ended up suing them in an attempt to silence them, but dropped the lawsuit right before the discovery process. Because what happens in the discovery process? You get to discover the financial documents of the organization that's accusing you of libel to prove the truth of the matters that you're asserting. Okay, we'll get back to it, including the UN and their role mm -hmm. and what's happening there in just a moment. Lawfare, the law as a weapon of war. The use of the law as a weapon of war with Brooke Goldstein. And I want to tell I want to I want to read you this. Mm -hmm. The UN is attempting to impose a blasphemy law that would silence all truth speaking about. Muslims. Part of Muslim-sponsored resolutions have already been implemented by the government. What is this about? What is this? Well, every year for the past 12 years, the United Nations Human Rights Commission has passed a resolution that attempts to make it a crime under international law to commit blasphemy, specifically to say anything critical about Islam which is an absolute shame because in, when I was in law school, the first thing I learned, first year of law school, is the cornerstone of any liberal democracy is the right to speak openly and critically, not just about government, but about religion. That is the essence of the separation of church and state. We got rid of blasphemy laws a long time ago, but now they're being resurrected at the United Nations. Why? Because of a 57-member voting bloc called the OIC, the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation. It's a group of Islamist states comprised of some totalitarian dictatorships, 
fascist theocratic regimes that have literally hijacked the General Assembly, hijacked the Human Rights Council, and resulting in the application of blasphemy law and international law. And this is now trickling down to different nation states. It's also trickling down to the United States, despite the fact that we have the First Amendment. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, this past December, had a three-day closed-door meeting with the head of the OIC, and they came out and they announced the implementation of Human Rights uh, Council Resolution 1618. All right, 1618 calls anyone who talks about Islam as terrorism an extremist and condemns the use of the media to condemn religion. This is all in violation of the principles that the First Amendment stands for. Spell out the First Amendment for us. The First Amendment guarantees the right to free speech, and it's been interpreted by the Supreme Court of the United States to allow any speech except for three categories defamation, a false statement of fact about somebody else that tends to harm their reputation. Number two, obscenity, like child pornography, for example. And number three, incitement to immediate violence, yelling fire in a crowded theater. Besides that, free you speech, anything. you could say anything. You could be a bigot in the United States. You can be a member of the KKK. You can deny the Holocaust. You can commit blasphemy. You can say anything you want about Jesus Christ, Buddha, Moses, and Mohammed as well. And the OIC wants to change that. Why do they want to change that? Because if we can't speak openly about Islamist terrorism, if we can't discuss it amongst ourselves, then we can't understand it. And if we can't understand it, then how are we supposed to defeat it? The other thing is that you give the terror, you give the threat to our legal system, to our way of life, you give it a name. And that's what people are not doing. They're either gunmen, or they're terrorists, or they're militants, or they're whatever. But they are never Muslims, and they are never Islamists. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something. There's a reason why we're confused. There's a reason why, you know, over 11 years after 9-11, you can go down to the footprint of the World Trade Center and ask 10 people to define terrorism. Ask anyone to define Islam as terrorism. I guarantee you, 9 out of 10 people won't be able to define it. Why? Because there's no leadership stemming from our international organizations, and there's no leadership also within um, the international community Does that's that willing to Canada. Well, no, Stephen Harper names? is absolutely fantastic. It is because of Stephen Harper, for example, that Canada no longer funds UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, whose task is to provide aid and education to the Palestinian territories, but in fact has been admitted to teaching off the Hamas payroll in their schools, uh, uh, sorry, hiring off the Hamas payroll, teaching from books provided by Hamas. Teaching that end from books up like the film that you showed provided us, by the, the Palestinian Authority, bombers. indoctrinating children to become suicide, homicide terrorists, to become child soldiers. UNRWA schools are so known as a So our government has stopped that funding. We, they have. Is the United States still funding UNRWA? Absolutely it is. And all in all, you can make the argument that by funding UNRWA, the United States, U.S. taxpayer dollars are going towards aiding and abetting the premeditated murder of Palestinian children because we're assisting the indoctrination of these children towards suicide homicidal violence. Which is a form of abuse. There is a lawyer that, the most egregious that, is, that is fighting that on the form of child abuse. The most egregious form of child abuse. In fact, I would argue that it's a form of premeditated murder. It's state-sponsored infanticide. And it's a human rights violation that the human rights community has been ignoring. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, while they do such a good job when it comes to child soldiers in Africa, for example, not one of these organizations has con consistently, coherently condemned the recruitment of innocent Muslim children towards violence. In fact, the same year that I was filming my movie, a group called Coalition to Stop the Use of Child Soldiers actually released a report claiming there exists no evidence that Palestinian militant groups were recruiting children for violent activities. No evidence, they said. We need organizations like you that are willing to do the spade work to expose it 
and the courage to expose it. You want to expand into Canada. Well, we hope to. We hope to. I mean, I, I'm in Canada right now raising awareness about the issue, and we have a project that we're engaging in right now. We are, are, are looking to, to raise funds to support a conference, the first ever conference at the United Nations that is about the legal rights of the Jewish people to the, to, uh, uh, the land of Israel and how to implement Based on those San Remo, rights the San Remo from San Remo on. And how to implement okay, how those can people rights. find the Lawfare Project? The Lawfare Project, we have a website. It's www.thelawfareproject.org. Lawfare is spelled L-A-W, F as in Frank, A-R-E. The book, Lawfare, the War Against Free Speech, is available on Amazon.com. And my other organization is the Children's Rights Institute.org. And we can find all that. And the movie is available on that as well, yeah. Keep us in the loop. Keep us in touch with what's going on, especially about that international conference. I will. Thank you so much. And good luck and thank you. Thank you. At an age when most young lawyers are interested in making it and focusing all their attention in this highly competitive world, to make a living and establish themselves. Adam Hummel is doing the same thing, actually, Adam, but you're also looking to make it in Kenya, sure. to make peace. You are, you've started a peace project that's virtually turned into a peace movement. Uh, yes, it, uh, it has, in a, in a small part of the country in Kenya, yes. How did the, all this start? Uh, okay, well, it's actually been a long time in the making. About three years ago, I, I traveled to Kenya for the first time as the participant of an organization uh, which, which sort of had as its mission um, something that we weren't at all going to be doing. They told me that we were going to be going to Kenya as a group, that we were going to be helping uh, a number of tribes sort out this cattle raiding issue that they had between them, and that we were going to try to set up income generating projects. What I discovered when we arrived there is that uh, I had arrived about four months after a civil war had broken out in Kenya. Um, all the other participants of the group uh, that I was traveling with had dropped out um, unbeknownst to me. And uh, what happened is I spent those three weeks there actually getting to know a lot of the people who were affected the most by the civil war and by the violence that lasted about two months at the beginning of 2008 in Kenya. And from those connections that I'd made with them, I was able to find out what they wanted, find out what they needed in terms of moving forward and getting over what had happened to them and trying to facilitate a project or what's slowly now becoming a movement uh, to, to um, attack the main issues that contributed to that violence and, and make sure that they aren't uh, brought to the fore in the next elections in Kenya in March uh, of 2013. Until then, Kenya was pretty peaceful. Uh, yes. Or did they have an undercurrent of warring tribes and factions always that the election brought out? Well, it's interesting. Kenya has a, has a very interesting history. It was established in 1963. There's 42 different tribes in Kenya, and there has always been this undercurrent of, um, of ethnic tension amongst the, the different communities. Um, at different times throughout its history, that tribal tension has come out, depending on who the president is and what tribe he comes from and the different people who are in power in Kenya. Uh, but this, in 2007, 2008, this civil war, this was the first time that the violence was uh, so mainstream that it spread right across the entire country. And it resulted in about 1,500 people being killed and, and almost half a million displaced. So this was the first time that it actually affected the entire country, specifically as a result of, uh, of tribalism. So here you come from Canada, this... this uh upbringing that is pretty, was pretty special. Your father's a doctor, you went to the best schools, you were president of Hillel and, and, and the president of the Jewish Student Union University. And, and you become involved in, with people that, whose language you don't know, who nobody was with you, with your white skin. <laughs> what made them listen to you? And how did you start? Well. I have to say from the beginning that this, I was simply doing a lot of the facilitating at the time. It was, what, what has happened as a result in these last three or four years has been entirely a result of the will of the people who I've been working with. They have come up with the ideas, they've come up with ways to reach out to other people. But you started with soccer. 
Yes, we started with soccer, which is like an international language. Soccer uh, is spoken everywhere, and everyone can bring together soccer. Uh, Uri Sevier, who's one of Israel's lead negotiators in all the in every peace negotiation since the Oslo Accords, he has a book called Peace First, and he says in the, his book that if he wanted to really, if he if people listened to him, if they knew the real key to Middle East peace, he would blanket the Middle East with soccer fields um, because he knows that that is the best way to bring people together. And from the minute we first started our soccer tournament in Kenya uh, four years ago, it's been a huge success. And the last one that we held in, in April 2012, a few months ago, sorry, a few months ago, uh, on our, in the final game, there were about 3,000 spectators that came out to watch in a very small village in the western part of Kenya. That's incredible. And this is all alone. Did anybody help you with this? Did anybody mentor you? Except reading the book the, by the Israeli. Yeah. Did anybody, was anybody with you in this? Uh, well, I was there by myself. A friend of mine, uh, Courtney, who I used to work with in the United Kingdom, she came over for a very short time to help uh, with the facilitation of some of the seminars. But otherwise, this has been uh, just me working with uh, the people over there, um, and working together. And they... How, who did you start with? What, 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 were they kids? Were they adolescents? Were they involved in anything? I actually started, when I went over there on that first trip, I was placed in a community center in a small village called Kipteri with a population of maybe a thousand. I uh, had no running water, no electricity, um, no luxuries at all. And I was in this community center with youths who, um, who were probably between the ages of 18 to 25. Were they going to school? Were they in a youth movement? They were involved through, um, it was an organization called Cohort. Um, and I can't actually recall off the top of my head what Cohort stands for now, but um, it, uh, actually it's Community Watch and Rescue Team. And what they do is they work with these youths um, trying to discuss issues that are, that are pertinent to them. So HIV and AIDS is obviously a, a very big issue over there right now. Um, violence after the, after the uh, post-election violence. Um, and those sorts of matters. And so they were brought together specifically to discuss this. And so I was, I was planted in among them. Um, and so that certainly helped. Did they helped. resist you? Did they listen? They listened. What was their attitude? They were very excited to have me there. There's not a lot of uh, tourism in this part of the country. They, uh, they listened to everything I, wanted, that everything I wanted to say. They listened to my ideas. And they listened to how I described Canada. Um, and so I was fortunate to be placed in a very receptive community. And it's just because of that that uh, everything was being, has been able to take off. And then it spun off. We'll find mm -hmm. out how it all developed and what's going on now in just a minute. Adam Hummel and your peace project in Kenya started with soccer and it brought people together. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? Well, we were very impressed with the reception that we received from the soccer tournament. And so uh, what, uh, what the group in Kenya and myself decided was that we should take out an advantage of these, this gathering of people from different uh, ethnic communities um, and try to actually implement a program with them. So what we did is we started a peace building seminar with uh, three different uh, tribes in Kenya, the Kisi, the Kalenjin and the Luo tribes, who are all were prominent. They, were they hostile to each other? Yes, these were three tribes that were extremely hostile towards each other during the post-election violence. They all live in the western part of Kenya, and they uh, had and, and this village where we were doing it now, where we held the workshop, was in a village called Sondu. Sondu is sort of a market town, so there's people um, from all different tribes who live in Sondu. And this was a hotspot for violence from the, these last elections in 2007, uh, the elections in 1997 as well. There's always been violence in Sondu. So this project that we were going to start, this was the first official project uh, since this most recent post-election violence to bring together these tribes in an official capacity. What we did is we had eight youths from each tribe uh, divided equally amongst boys and girls, so we had uh, 24 uh, youths come in and participate in a five-day workshop where we talked about issues of war and peace and shared values and we tried to get them to speak openly about what happened during the post-election violence and the reasons for the post-election violence and we tried to teach them about other conflicts that are going on in the world and things that have happened in the past. We taught them about the Holocaust, about the genocide Do they in know Rwanda. about the Holocaust? Do they know about They did not know like about that? the Holocaust um, or some of them knew about it very, very little but they didn't really know about it. I was surprised at um, how little they actually knew about the genocide in Rwanda as well, as they were quite young when it was happening mm -hmm. also. 
Um, so we, and, and we spoke about the conflict in the Middle East as well, because though it is very different, it is very similar in terms of many of the trends that go on between them. And so we wanted to show that, that uh, they're not necessarily alone in, in, terms of the, in terms of the conflict that they find themselves a part of, um, but that there are different ways of approaching it. And so this workshop was hugely successful. And from this group, we created the group called the Youth Ambassadors for Peace, which is uh, the name of the, the group today. Um, and today it's comprised of those 24 youths from the first seminar. We had 20 at a second seminar, which we ran last summer. And then a few months ago, one of the participants from the first workshop actually conducted his own workshop in another part of the country um, to open it up to a few so more spreading. groups. spreading. Yes, mm -hmm. spreading. It's opening up. Yeah, very nicely. And people are receptive. Yeah, the youths are very receptive. And I've actually also been impressed by the, how, receptive, how, how receptive the elders in the community are. Because um, in Africa, there's, there's obviously a, a hierarchy uh, in each community amongst uh, the elders all the way down to the youths. And um, the elders are obviously given a lot of deference. Um, and they're also the ones who, who went through colonialism, who, who really, who really uh, took part in this tribalism, which is, which is really like racism. It's, it's just astounding a, to me as you speak, now that you're bringing the elders into it and how they receive you, mm -hmm. that they don't resent you. No, I, on the opposite, actually. I was actually made an elder of one of the, the groups that we worked with, uh, which was so touching um, because, uh, thankfully, I'm not nearly an elder. <laughs> and I, uh, and, but they, they were so receptive to me that they, they afforded me that, and they, um, they've, they've really taken all the youths who've been involved into their, into their care, and they've tried to spread the word um, through their own sort of elder network and, and to get the word out there. So uh, it's, we've been very um, blessed by the way that it's been received in the communities. And you're doing work with, with contributing to AIDS. How, how prevalent is AIDS there in Kenya? AIDS is a big issue there. Um, it, is, it is very prevalent amongst the youths, um, maybe not as much as in other, in other countries uh, in Africa, but, um, but Kenya is dealing with it in its own way. They, they do provide antiretroviral drugs, and they, um, they have clinics which, uh, which assist people who have recently been diagnosed. And when we started, I didn't want to... I already sometimes feel like I've that we've tried to bite off more than we can chew, but we really did want to try to get into the, this AIDS and HIV issue because it is so prevalent there. And not on, this wasn't my idea at all, but some of the youths, one day we email back and forth with the different ideas and with their need money for, for a budget for anything. And, I, and in one email I received one day, uh, at the end of the budget it said uh, a certain amount and it said chicken farm. And I emailed back and I said, what is this chicken farm? And they said, well, we've come up with this idea of a way to help support the people in our communities who have recently been diagnosed with HIV or AIDS. And what we do, and now in the last two years, we've started this chicken project uh, where we buy chickens and we use their eggs and we donate these eggs to uh, people who have been recently diagnosed with HIV or AIDS. And it's both a way for them to receive a bit of uh, nutrients and eggs are a little bit more expensive in the small villages. So we're able to provide them with that for free. But the most important thing is they're getting a bit of moral support from the youths in these communities because what I noticed only the last time that I was there last year was that um, people who are HIV positive are shunned by the community. People don't want to shake their hands. People don't want to speak to them um, because there's a lot of ignorance still about HIV and AIDS there. And so what we're doing is we're showing them that there are youths who are willing and able to support them and we want to show that they are not going to be marginalized by their communities. And so this farm, which is today called, uh, I got a, a great, uh, a really nice jo donation from a friend of mine in Israel, Nikki. So it's called Nikki's Chickies, the <laughs> project. And, uh, and today they're, they're expanding the farm now. We have about 160 chickens, which lay, I think, about 50 eggs each day. So uh, it's great. And it's become self-sustainable because we sell half the eggs to maintain the farm and we donate the other half. There is so much that has come out of a soccer game <laughs> and there's more to come. We'll find out more after we come back. Adam Hummel and his peace project that's burgeoning into a peace movement. And the book he's written about his experiences, Amani Haki Yetu, Peace is Our Right, Peace in Kenya. It, did I say this right? Did I pronounce this yes, right? Yes, you did. Amani and where can is we peace. get it? Uh, it's available on Barnes and Noble and on Amazon as either a proper book or as an ebook as well. And all proceeds are going to the peace cause, to Adam Hummel's peace projects, 
which are numerous, numerous now, yes. n much more than one, in Kenya. You have been, until you started this, you were extremely active. You were one of the prominent young leaders in the Jewish community. You were president of Hillel at York University, president of the Jewish Student Union at the University of Windsor, where you went to law school. And you've done other things involved with Judaism, which you say it's because of Judaism that you're doing what you're doing. Absolutely. But has anybody questioned you about why you're not putting all your energy into Israel and issues related to Israel and anti-Semitism? Yes, well, I get two questions. I get questions as to why I'm not doing something in Israel and also from people in my South African community why I'm not doing something in South Africa because there's obviously many problems in South Africa as well. And I think that the best answer that I can afford to say is that, and it's 100% true, is that everything, all my involvement has come out of my Jewish education and my Jewish values and my Jewish upbringing. Um, that being said, I, don't, I think that there are, uh, uh, there are obviously many, many, many people who are involved in the conflict in the Middle East and who have a say in it and who have a stake in it as well. I was fortunate to be involved in this, to, to get to know these people in Kenya. And as soon as I got to know them and as soon as I made a connection with them, it was very difficult for me to turn, to turn away from them, to, to even stay away for more than a year. I went back seven months later as soon as I was finished my first year of law school. And so um, even though there are, you know, there's a million different causes that need, uh, that need attention in the world. And even though it, being Jewish uh, automatically, um, uh, you know, I, I have an affinity towards Jewish issues and to Israel and the Middle East, um, this is something where I was able to actually use those, uh, these Jewish values and put them into action in a small part of the world where there's not a lot of attention given, where um, I'm able to really see the, the, uh, the product of, this, of these values, like tikkun olam. And you know, I, was, I also talk in the book about uh, this idea of b'tselem elokim, making yourself in the image of God. Um, I think that using those values and trying to to create uh, a sort of uh, a project or to help facilitate a project based on those values, this is everything that's come out of this has been a result of that. And so even though it's not in Israel and it's not a Jewish issue necessarily, everyone there knows I'm Jewish. Every, the Israeli flag is on many of the projects. And you saw the Israeli flag in, yes, in your on, office. In yeah, your it's office. on the outside of the office. Um, it's also on the chicken project because the donor, Nikki, is from Israel. Um, and so everyone knows this. And, they, and it's great. There's a picture now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's great because it's a it's a very nice way of doing uh, of doing outreach. It's a it's a group again in a small part of the world where they're very welcoming to, to visitors. They believe a visitor is a blessing, and as as devout Christians as well, they believe that uh, that Jews are their older brother, and they have such an amazing respect for Judaism. And uh, the people who I've spoken to there, when we've had talks about Judaism, um, it's amazing what they know about it and how they embrace it and and what they and how they have such a curiosity about it especially me being, you know, the only Jew that they've ever met. So for me... Do you feel like a shaliach? Do you feel like an emissary? I've never thought of myself as a shaliach, but I... Um, nor am I, you know, going at it with any specific agenda, but to be able to, to you know, in a time when, uh, when having allies as a, as, a, as a Zionist and as a Jew is, is becoming increasingly difficult, it is really uh, reassuring and very nice to know that in a, in a part of the world like this where... There are very kind and open people that um, that they're able to embrace uh, what uh, what we value so much. So a lot of, of of attitudes in Africa, especially, are due to ignorance and lack of contact with Jews or with anything Jewish. Is that would you would you agree to that? Well. Yeah, well, they, again, they, they know very... Because they, some of them are Muslims as well, right? Yes, and they know, they know a little bit about politics. They read the newspaper every day. They know what's going on in the world, um, you know, at least on a surface level. What they know about Judaism, they know from purely a religious uh, viewpoint. And so, um, yeah, it is difficult. It is, I mean, and we're in a small village where there isn't a lot of, uh, where there isn't a lot of necessarily communications with the outside world. But um, ignorance is all over the world. People say that, you know, you don't know, um, George Kimball is an author. He said that the darkest thing about Africa is our ignorance of it. Um, and I think that that can, that what we're trying to do now is shed some light on it to show that uh, what is going on there now. And the same goes the other way, is that uh, if you don't ask the right questions or if you don't necessarily have contact, which we, we take for granted here, then uh, you might not know everything that you need to know. Adam, you've created something 
that didn't exist before, and that is meeting with enormous success. It bypasses politics, it bypasses tribalism, and it gets people face to face in another way that politics usually divides and religion. It sounds to me like you have a template that could be used anywhere. You know, it's, I, I don't know if it could be used everywhere because I say that the, again, when I get questioned about why, this, why we're not doing this in Israel or in the Middle East, I think there's a big difference and that is what I feel from the youths in Kenya is that they really want this. They really want to make peace right now. They really are craving something. And what happens with their politics is directly related to how they live their lives. And so I don't know if that's necessarily transferable to, to other conflicts in the world. I think that that desire and that drive and that heart that's to that we start see with. there is uh, there. The but motivation. Certainly. I think crossing political, bo political boundaries is, is very important. And I think that um, grassroots movements without any... Uh, uh, interruption by other um, powers that be or anything will push really, forward. Really, it's a bottom-up approach rather it than a top-down approach yeah. with politics, with politicians, with elected officials. Mm -hmm. This really is grassroots. It has to be. That's the best way to succeed. I wish you the best of luck. Keep Thank us informed. Much. Absolutely. And again, your book, the proceeds of which go to the Peace Project in Kenya, and good luck. Thank and you. thank you, Adam Hubble. Thank you for having me.